I want to start off by saying that, um, yeah, my work has been, uh, although I don't personally, I haven't personally interacted with Dirk very much, uh, my work has been quite heavily motivated and influenced by, by his work. Um, and yeah, my, my PhD advisor is Karen, who was advised by Dirk. So sort of like my academic grandfather, you could say. Um, and yeah, obviously one way in which uh, influence is gonna be displayed in this talk. Um, so I'm gonna sort of a high level, I'm gonna talk about um, some tree-like equations. So these are, these are gonna be generalizations of, uh, well, the generalizations of certain Dyson Schwinger equations. Um, and then I'm going to describe how uh, so chord diagrams come into play when solving these. All right. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure most people here know the Kronkramer Hopf algebra. Um, so it's combinatorial Hopf algebra introduced by Dirk uh, in the context of renormalization. Um, it's free commutative algebra, freely generated over, uh, so in this case, field F by the set of rooted trees. Uh, the product is concatenation of forests and the co-product looks like this. Um, yeah, you're basically uh, splitting a tree at the vertices of an anti-chain. Um, and so what's sort of the relevant property um, here uh, is the universal property of Kronkramer. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Kronkramer is uh, important in certain contexts. Um, so it has this universal property uh, and it is the only Hopf algebra up to isomorphism with this property. Um, so what is this property um, for those who may not be familiar with it? Um, so if we have a co-algebra co A, uh, we first have to define something called the Hochschild one co-cycle. This comes from uh, Hochschild cohomology. Um, and it's a linear map, so a linear map uh, from the coalgebra to itself, um, where it satisfies this equation, um, which basically says what happens if you um, take the composition of the map of the, uh, the coproduct and the linear map L. Um, then you basically get two terms. You have the identity tensor L composed with the coproduct plus this extra term of L uh, tensor one. Um, well, this is the yeah, this is the identity map. This is the identity. Uh, yeah, so that's what a co one cocycle is. Um, and for Kong Krimer, um, the add a root operator. So this is the operator that takes a bunch of trees um, and you basically uh, add, e add, a, add a root and then stick each tree uh, as a child of that root. Um, so this operator is a one co-cycle. You can check that this equation is satisfied. And then this is the universal property uh, proved by uh, Kahn and Kramer. Um, so we have a commutative algebra A over a field F, and we have some linear map from A to itself. Um, then there exists, what, what the uh, universal property says is that there exists a unique algebra homomorphism from uh, Kahn Krimer to this commutative algebra A, such that uh, if you compose the homomorphism with B plus, that is the same as composing L with the homomorphism. So basically this homomorph homomorphism is turning um, B plus into L essentially. Um, uh, and if you assume a bit more about A, you get some stronger properties on the homomorphism. So if A is a bialgebra, so both an algebra and a co-algebra um, in a compatible way, and L is a one co-cycle, so that's where the one co-cycle comes in, then uh, this homomorphism rho L is a bialgebra homomorphism. 
and if A is also a Hopf algebra, then the homomorphism becomes a Hopf algebra homomorphism. So, I mean, these are both just saying that it's co uh, compatible with that structure. Um, yeah, so that's a really nice property. Um, so, and then slightly differently, uh, where are the tree-like equations going to come from? Um, or how are we going to motivate them at least? Um, we're going to motivate them by these subalgebras. Um, so these are um, some pop subalgebras um, of Kong primer that uh, Foisy looked at. Um, and they're generated by a family of recursive equations of the following form. Um, so we have T of X uh, is equal to X times then we're applying B plus to phi of T of X. So phi is some formal power series. Um, and it has a uh, basically a non-zero constant term setting it equal to one. Um, so this gives some, some like, uh, formal power series solution with coefficients uh, in con Krimer. Um, and so if we write uh, P sub n for the, the nth coefficient of you know, the solution to this equation, then um, Foisy characterized when the subalgebra generated by those coefficients, by the TNs, um, subalgebra uh, of con Krimer is Hopf. So when, it, when it's a Hopf subalgebra, um, and the theorem is this, so it's a Hopf subalgebra if and only if uh, the formal power series phi uh, has this simple form. Uh, yeah, so it's basically just specified by two constants, A and B. Um, yeah, and it's basically just this simple like yeah, linear polynomial raised to this fractional power. Um, so we're going to basically apply the universal property to get uh, these tree-like equations that we want to look at, um, which are motivated by these, uh, what you could call like tree equations uh, here. So in this case, you could you could apply um, you could think about applying this to sort of any uh, algebra or co-algebra um, uh, or bi-algebra structure. We're going to apply it to the polynomial algebra uh, and a linear map from polynomial algebra to itself, and that gives some algebra homomorphism via the uh, universal property from Kong Primer to the polynomial algebra. Um, so this polynomial algebra is just the algebra of polynomials. Um, and so yeah, you get this algebra homomorphism. And then we apply this to the tree equation. So we apply it to both sides. And that gives this two variable equation. Um, yeah, where L is now, so B plus has become L, this linear map. Um, and so uh, one way you can think about this is that, um, so in this case, the, the algebra homomorphism corresponds to the Feynman rules, um, mapping each Feynman graph to its associated Feynman integral uh, via the tree of subdivergences. Um, and this is going to ultimately, you can sort of sometimes think of this as a kind of Dyson Schwinger equation. Um, or like a generalization of Dyson Schwinger equation. So here we're just working with any any arbitrary linear map. Um, that's not necessarily going to give you much that's all that interesting. Um, but the universal property sort of points the way to what would be interesting to look at, which is uh, one co-cycles arising, arising from co-algebra structures on the, uh, the polynomial algebra, um, f of y. Yeah. 
And just a comment, you could also, you know, not look at the polynomial algebra. You could look at some other algebra and co-algebra structures on that algebra and then consider one co-cycles for those, um, which may be of interest, but we're gonna focus on the polynomial uh, really by algebra here um, or co-algebra at the very least. Um, and there are actually two classic uh, graded co-algebras on polynomials. So it's the binomial co-algebra and the divided power co-algebra. Um, and they're isomorphic, um, but they, which one we look at does matter here because we're keeping the algebra the same, but varying the co-algebra. Um, so we'll get different results. Um, so for the binomial co-algebra, the co-product is the following. Um, yeah, you get this binomial coefficient. You're breaking y to the n into uh, y to the k tensor y to the n minus k. Um, now, if in uh, what we get then is that uh, we get this lemma uh, defining or uh, you know describing the one cocycles for the binomial coalgebra. Um, oh, this should be f of y. Uh, so what this says is that there is, uh, so for each such co one co-cycle, there's a power series F of Z defining it uh, and the action of L on Y to the N um, is given by, so you substitute in a differential operator uh, into F, this power series, this formal power series, and then that uh, is applied to t to the n, and then we're integrating all of that from zero to y. Um, yeah, so that gives the the one cycle for the binomial coalgebra, um, and then for the divided power coalgebra. So what does that look like? It looks basically the same, but we're just dropping the binomial coefficient from the co-product. And then the corresponding one co-cycles look also very similar. They're also defined by some form of power series F. And in this case, you replace the differential operator here by a different, a slightly different sort of operator that sort of behaves similarly. So if you look at its action on, or how it acts on uh, Y to the N, instead of, uh, dropping the exponent by one and then multiplying it by n, you just drop the exponent by one. So all this operator does is drop exponents by one, basically. Um, or if you have constants, uh, they go to zero. Um, so we're substituting that into f, just like we did up here. And then instead of integrating, we're just multiplying by y. Um, yeah, so that's what that's what the one cosines look like for the divided power coalgebra. Um, yeah, so we have these two coalgebras, and we can look at uh, the tree-like equations for each of them. So now we have uh, the equation we were looking at before, and L is now uh, it could be a one cycle for the binomial coalgebra or a one cycle for the divided power coalgebra, and we're sort of interested in solving both of these. Um, and we can think of these as uh, dyson schwinger equations, in particular, the former corresponds to a dyson schwinger equation um, for a class of Feynman graphs generated by where we're recursively inserting at one place in a single primitive graph. Um, if we keep the Feynman integral unspecified, then we get exactly this, where unspecified just means like, you consider an arbitrary like Laurent, uh, Laurent expansion, um, Laurent series expansion of that, of, of whatever the Feynman integral is, um, then you get basically this, this first uh, equation uh, from the binomial coalgebra. The divided power coalgebra doesn't really correspond uh, to a Dyson-Schwinger equation, at least as far as I know, in the same way. Um, but yeah, uh, it's sort of motivated by, by the same background. Um, 
so what, what I was kind of interested in, what we were kind of interested in, um, along with Karen um, and what others have looked at as well in the past, um, is solving these uh, via some like or as some like weighted generating functions indexed by some nice combinatorial objects. Um, this has already been done for this first equation um, the, with the binomial one co-cycle, but not for the second one. No one's, no one's, as far as I know, no one's looked at the second one before. Um, and so how was it done for this first one and how did we do it for the second one also is, uh, well, the way it generated functions are gonna be indexed by core diagrams. Um, so let me briefly explain some of the, the background here. Um, core diagram is perfect matching of the set one up to two n. So that just means you're pairing, uh, you're pairing these elements up. Um, so we might represent it by this, this sort of diagram where the chords are just these little lines. Uh, yeah. And we have to look at, um, we want to define some parameters in order to specify the solution to these tree-like equations. Um, and those parameters are going to be defined in terms of the core diagram and its directed intersection graph. Um, so the directed intersection graph uh, has the chords as vertices. The directed intersection graph of this core diagram has the chords as vertices and two chords are adjacent if and only if they cross. So like literally you look at the diagram and if the two lines cross, then the chords cross, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's uh, an intersection graph associated with each chord diagram. Um, and it's directed in the sense that, uh, so one chord that comes a little earlier in the diagram, so it's it's a source, uh, first endpoint comes earlier than the first endpoint of the other chord, then, that, then we, we put a directed edge from this from say this chord to the next chord. Um, so from earlier chords to later chords, uh, we direct them that, in that way. So we're gonna be interested in certain special chords that uh, are uh, in a sense terminal. So they're terminal in the sense that there are no outgoing edges in the direct intersection graph. Um, or they have no outgoing incident edges. Um, so in particular, what that means for the diagram is a terminal chord uh, has no uh, chords that cross it to the right. So for example, this chord diagram right here has three terminal chords, uh, basically these last three chords, because they have no chords crossing, crossing them to the right. But everything else uh, does have a chord crossing to the right. So they are not terminal. So those are going to be important um, for defining the solution to these tree-like equations. And a diagram uh, is, so one, one particular type of diagram that's especially relevant um, are one terminal diagrams. So they're diagrams that have exactly one terminal chord. Um, and if there's only one terminal chord, or there is always one terminal chord, and that is the last chord. So the chord whose endpoint comes at the very end, um, whose second endpoint, whose uh, sync comes at the very end. One other thing that we need, which is, uh, so there's, a, there's one standard way to order, to, to give a uh, total order on the chords of a chord diagram. The, first, the most standard way is just to look at the first endpoint of each chord, um, so the, the source of each chord, um, and then it's just order by that. Um, there's another. There's a few other ways to to define a total order on chord diagrams. At least a few other ways, um, and one that will be important here is called the intersection order. Um, and how this order works is you label the root chord, so that's the very first chord, uh, this very first chord, one, and then you remove it 
And when you remove it, you'll get a bunch of nested connected components. Um, so nested connected core diagrams. So uh, they're connected in the sense that the, the intersection graph is connected. Um, and then what you do is you label the first connected component uh, recursively, and then you label the second one and so on. And the labels determine the order. Um, yeah. In general, that order is not going to uh, correspond to this like standard order by the first endpoints of each chord. They're actually going to diverge quite a bit in general. Um, yeah. So, okay, what does the solution look like to these tree like equations? We will focus on the, the divided power one. Um, so, First, we have to mention um, something that we'll need to define the solution to the divided power uh, tree like equation. Um, so, one thing that one might notice is that there are exactly two core diagrams whose intersection graph, uh, if you forget the directions, is an induced cycle. So, that's a cycle with no uh, well, no chords. Um, so a cycle that it, uh, yeah, is also a whole. Um, and those two induced cycle chord diagrams are what we're calling the top cycle and bottom cycle. So this one right here and this one right here. These are the only two ways to make uh, an induced cycle of any particular size um, as a chord diagram. So, okay, then we can define the solution. Um, well, mostly define it at least. Um, so if we look at the, the divided power uh, tree-like equation that we had before. Um, it is uniquely solved by the following power series, formal power series in X and Y. So, Formal power series is indexed by top cycle free chord diagrams. So these are chord diagrams that don't have any top cycles as sub diagrams. So um, this chord diagram doesn't appear, is forbidden to appear as a sub diagram of these chord diagrams. Um, So you can think of it as sort of like halfway to tree to to tree to, di to diagrams that are just trees. Uh, if we forbid if we forbid both top and bottom cycles, then we just have trees. Um, but it's sort of halfway there. Um, so those are those are what's indexing the formal power series solution. Um, and then we have uh, so the x variable is sort of counted by uh, this is counting the size. Um, of the core diagram. And the y variable is uh, counting the uh, position of the first terminal chord. These are these terminal chords. There's going to be a first one um, in the intersection order. It's, it's uh, index in, that, in the intersection order. Um, that's going to be this t1 of c. So it's uh, y is sort of counting the uh, the index of the first terminal chord um, minus one. And then uh, somewhat unusually, we're sort of a, we're applying uh, the divided power one co cycle to this. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, really, for each chord diagram, you're getting uh, a y to the i for all i up to the index of the first terminal chord minus one. Um, is how that works, or no, just the index of the first terminal chord. Um, yeah. And then uh, to this, we have a few different weights. Um, so one of the weights, phi sub c, is just some weight that's determined by the coefficients of the, the uh, formal power series phi that defines the tree like equation. Um, those I'm not actually going to define, um, but they're relatively simple and they're just determined by C. And then sort of more importantly, 
is this F, FC. Um, these, this is a weight uh, that's determined by the co. So these are the these are the coefficients F I of that formal power series F that defined uh, the divided power one cos cycle. So this L div. Um, so the, this these F I's are the coefficients of that formal power series F defining the one cos cycle. And this weight is defined by so basically we're indexing, we're taking a product of these coefficients indexed by differences in the consecutive or adjacent uh, uh, terminal chords. So the indices of these terminal chords in the intersection order, we're looking at those and then we're taking the differences of consecutive indices of these terminal chords. Um, those differences are going to index these terms in this product of the uh, Fi coefficients. Um, and then we also get uh, an, an F0 raised to the uh, size of C minus K. Um, yeah, so basically you can just think of this as just some weight that's determined by uh, the one co cycle and the positions of the terminal chords in the intersection order. Um, yeah. So that's the solution. It's relatively nice. Um, and okay, so now what uh, we're sort of interested in is thinking about how we can uh, analyze this solution and what sort of uh, combinatorial questions uh, does this motivate? And one of them is, one of the obvious ones is counting uh, these top cycle free core diagrams that haven't been counted before. Um, and in particular, we would like to determine um, the number of top cycle free diagrams of size N and uh, with the first terminal chord having index K. So those are those are precisely the diagrams that index the solution. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to describe what that count is. Um, how we get that count is we're going to we're going to find a bijection. So I'm not really going to describe that describe how to prove it, but the way you would do this is you find a bijection to some other combinatorial object that has already been counted or some other combinatorial objects that have already been counted. Um, that's the most simple, the most straightforward way at least and the sort of uh, most combinatorially illuminating way. Um, and what are those other objects? Uh, they're gonna be triangulations. Um, so triangulations in this case are plane graphs in which every bounded face is a triangle. So the un unbounded face um, is not necessarily a triangle. So a triangle is uh, just three vertices, all of which are mutually adjacent. Um, and yeah, we're forcing every bounded face to be a triangle, but um, the unbounded face may not be a triangle. It might have uh, more than three vertices. And we're actually specifically gonna look at rooted triangulation. So we're rooting at a uh, boundary edge. So this is an edge on the boundary face, on the bounded, uh, the unbounded face, the exterior face. Um, and we'll call vertices that are not on the unbounded face, uh, interior vertices, so on, on bounded faces. Those vertices are gonna be in, interior vertices. Um, and the one, the vertices on the unbounded face will be exterior vertices. So this is just what one of these triangulations look like. All the bounded faces are triangles. We're rooting at this edge up here. Um, and uh, yeah, the unbounded face is not a triangle because it has more than three vertices. Uh, yeah. I mean, it could be a triangle, of course, but in this case, it is not a triangle. Um, 
So then what do we get? Uh, well, there's an old result uh, from the 60s by uh, William Brown um, that counts, that counted the number, uh, he counted the number of rooted triangulations with a given number of interior vertices, so in this case, n and m plus three exterior vertices. There always have to be at least three exterior vertices. Uh, and the number of these, of number of these, is given by this uh, fraction of uh, factorials. So that's a relatively nice, you know, explicit expression. Um, and it turns out th this is exactly the object. Uh, these are the exa exactly the objects that are in bijection, the top cycle free core diagram. So we have the following theorem. Um, one can find a bijection between uh, connected top cycle free diagrams. Oh, this is one thing that I forgot to mention actually. Um, the, uh, the solutions here, uh, oh, did I skip over it? I did. Uh, this is actually, uh, these are, these, I should have said, these are connected top cycle free core diagrams. So they have to be, uh, the intersection graph of these diagrams has to be connected. Um, yeah. So there exists a bijection between uh, connected top cycle free diagrams with n chords and the first terminal chord having index k in the intersection order. T1 is k. Um, and rooted triangulations with n minus k interior vertices and k plus one exterior vertices. So in some sense, this is almost a more natural object to work with. Because um, instead of you know, dealing with this, the intersection order, first terminal chord, we're just dealing with uh, interior vertices and exterior vertices of a triangulation. Um, yeah. Uh, and that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. All right, I see a question in the Q and A, um, where Marcus asks if there's any hope to calculate the values for the top cycle free diagrams of size n, but then where you have information on the other terminal chords or whatever the analog of. Yeah, of the, of the other terminal chords. Yeah, um, yeah, you would certainly want that um, to know more. I think it's, yeah, I think it's probably possible, um, perhaps also by looking looking further at the, uh, the related parameters in the triangulations um, and getting another bijection or just looking directly at the diagrams and explicitly counting them um, but I haven't you know what the that. number of other terminal chords is going to correspond to in the, uh, in the triangulations. Uh, that is a good question. I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, you'd have, to, there'd be some sort of recursive thing. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't thought too much about that. Are there other questions? Uh, I had a quick question just in general, the divided power algebra, of algebra versus the binomial one. I mean, if I think about it naively, right, there's this exponential connection. I mean, when one x is primitive and the other is group-like. So can you somehow transform transport this relation between the Hopf algebras to, your, to the different results for the two cases, or do you have to do independent calculations for both? Um, I think generally I have to do independent calculations. Um, there may be something there. It would be really nice if there was some way to, uh, yeah, to transform that, that connection between the like the co-algebras or the, the Hopf algebras um, to yeah, these like core diagram solutions. Uh, I don't know of such a way, but that would be nice if there was. Thank you. 
Well, and as people are thinking of remaining questions, maybe just as a comment, the side you didn't emphasize uh, is that you have a more conceptual way of proving the original core diagram result that my original proof of was ugly, quite frankly. So there's, yes, there's yes. value on both sides, even if the connection between them is not completely clear. Any other questions? Yes, I have a quick one still. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so with this universal property, then can you just go out um, to a Hopf algebra and chord diagrams this way too, or not? Uh, is there a Hopf algebra and chord diagrams? That's yeah. That's that's another way to phrase the question. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, I've thought a bit about this, but I don't know if such a Hopf algebra. Um, it would be nice if there was something like that and that was relevant here. Um, yeah. I guess the, the follow-up question would be if, if a half algebra of core diagrams could be set up, then what would be the combinatorial objects indexing the formal solution to the Dyson Singer <laughs> equations in that half algebra? Good question. <laughs> All right, seeing no further questions, let's thank Lucas again.